If you will, uh, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew 15. Now, I didn't intend for this to be a history lesson, but I wanted to share a little something with you. And I shared some of this with you a long time ago, but I got a little more in-depth on it this time. Have you ever wondered where Mother Day come from and how it started? Well, I found, I did, like I said, I shared some with you before in the past, maybe five or six years ago. But here's a little bit more to it. Uh, in 1858, there was a lady named Ann Jarvis. Uh, she organized a Mother's Day work club. And the purpose for this was, was to improve the sanitary conditions to help stop the infant mortality rate. They, they were losing a lot of babies, and this was in Grafton, West Virginia, where she was from, right there in her community. And for Miss Reeves, this was a personal matter. This lady had born 13 children, only four made it to adulthood. Now, I don't know at what point these children died, whether they died at birth or later on or later on in life, but before they ever became an adult, they died. Uh, ten years later, in 1868, just three years after the Civil War, Ms. Jarvis coordinated a Mother's Friendship Day in her state of Virginia. Okay, The purpose for this was to bring together, for the first time since the war, veterans from the North and South. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but West Virginia ain't always been. West Virginia didn't become a state until 1863. They broke off from Virginia. And half of Virginia, or a little better than half, fought for the Union. A little less than that fought for the South. Well, you can imagine what the atmosphere was like in that state after the Civil War. Pretty tense. Well, here's her purpose in doing that. She brought both sides together. And to say it was tense is an understatement, but at the end of the day, that both sides wept, they shook hands, and made peace. And so Miss Jarvis, you could say she was a woman of compassion and, and a woman that was a peacemaker. All right, two years later, 1870, American poet and songwriter Julia Ward Howell, you know her as the lady who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Well, she's considered by some to be the forerunner of the modern day Mother's Day celebrations. But she became an advocate in her own right, suggesting a Mother's Peace Day. She believed that war was preventable, and she believed that mothers, mothers had a sacred right to protect their, the lives of their sons, to keep them going off to war. Three years later, the inaugural uh, celebration of Mrs. Howe's Mother's Day took place in the month of June. Now, obviously, that didn't remain that way. Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. May 14th, 1905, Miss Jarvis died. She passed away. Three years after that, 1908, her daughter, Anna Jarvis, has a memorial service at that time to, to in memory of her mother. In 1910, the governor of West Virginia decided to make it a statewide holiday, recognizing the second Sunday in May as an official holiday. Well, five years later, four years later, excuse me, 1914, Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, made it official national holiday to where we're at now. That's how Mother's Day got started. I bet you didn't think it takes so much to get Mother's Day started, would you? To create a, to create a day that specifically recognizes all that mothers do for their families, for their children. But if you seriously consider that, if you consider what all mothers do for their family, every day should be Mother's Day. I mean, really, you're the alarm clock, you're the cook, you're the maid, you're the accountant, you're the psychologist, you're the disciplinarian, and if you're a Christian mother, you're also the intercessor. That's the most important thing. You're an intercessor. Every day she goes before God on behalf of her children and her husband. So thank God for praying mothers. Amen? Uh, the passage that we're going to look at today is about a mother who comes to Jesus interceding on behalf of her daughter who is demon-possessed. And to say this woman is desperate for her child is an understatement. Uh, if it were possible, uh, any mother worth her salt would move heaven and earth for her child. No doubt in my mind. Just to get them out of harm's way. So when you consider the seriousness of this situation, there's no surprise here as to what extreme that she was willing to go to to help her daughter. This is a Gentile woman. To be more specific, this is a Canaanite woman humbling herself before a Jewish man, and not just a Jew, any Jewish man, but the God-man, Jesus Christ. So if you found your place, stand with me now, and we'll honor the reading of God's Word. Beginning at verse 21 says this, Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began crying, crying out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. 
But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples kept and came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, and saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Let's pray. Great God, thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for this uh, time that we can come together in a time of fellowship. But Lord, in a time to worship you and lift up our praise to you for who you are. Lord, whether you've done anything for us or not, it doesn't change who you are. You're still a great and awesome God. And we thank you for being such. And we thank you, Father for your son Jesus, who obeyed your will, came down and died on the cross so that many may know you as Lord and Master. Thank you for that. And Lord, I want to thank you for our mothers today. Every one of them. Every one of them that are here. For my mother. For my stepmother. Lord, I pray your blessings on these ladies. They are intercessors. Lord, if they believe in you and hold you close to their heart, they are intercessors on our behalf. I know that my grandmother prayed for me. I know that my mother prayed for me and my stepmother prayed for me. And I thank you for the hearing and answering their prayers. Without those prayers being answered, Lord, I wouldn't be here today. It's Lord, and I'm going to imagine that everybody in this auditorium right now and those that see this videotape can say the same thing. Thank God for a praying mother. But Lord, I ask that you be glorified today and that you be lifted up. And Lord, that you speak to every heart today, that you bring them comfort. Because I know there's some sadness at some times like this when you think about the mothers that have gone on. But it's a time to rejoice too because if their mother was a believer in Christ, you know where she's at. And we just rejoice in that. And so Lord, we give you praise. And none of this is possible without you. And so we give you praise for that. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that needs to, to lay that burden down or, or draw them in with conviction, I pray that you speak to that heart as well. But Lord, I pray your blessings upon this service and that you be glorified. And we ask this in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen. You can be seated. So why was it taboo for a Canaanite to interact with a Jew? Or you could say that vice versa. Why was it a taboo for a Jew to interact with a Canaanite? Well, these were some pretty vile people. Uh, if you look back through the history of it, the Canaanite people were descendants from Ham. Ham was the son of Noah. If you remember, Ham was the one who was cursed by Noah because of some wickedness that he had done toward his father. Uh, that's a whole other story in itself. But his descendants are the Canaanites. And they practiced rampant immorality, idolatry of all kinds. They were so vile that God marked them for distinction in Exodus chapter 23. I mean, they had 400 plus years. And somebody's going to say, well, that's not fair. Wait a minute. They had 400 years in which to repent and would not. And would not. So if that's the case, you have to ask the question, why would Jesus give this woman the time of day? Well, here I think is the answer to this question. And you find this in John chapter 6, verses 37 through 40. He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that the Father sent this woman to Jesus. Jesus made it clear a few verses later in verse 44. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. It was the will of the Father that this poor woman would come to Jesus. And Jesus, who came to do the will of the Father, did not cast her out. When she came to him, she came to him in a humble state. She believed Jesus to be who he said he was, and as a result, the Lord answered her prayer. Now, Scripture says that the Lord's first priority was to minister to the people of Israel, to reveal himself as their Messiah, and to offer the kingdom to the Jew first, as Paul would say. However, Jesus said this too. He said, salvation is from the Jews, John 4, 22, to make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 19. Now, you will never find in Scripture where Jesus refused, ever. he never refused anyone who came to him in faith. And this Canaanite woman, who had no knowledge of God's Word, she has no blessing from God, she came to Jesus believing in his healing power. 
So how could that be possible? The only logical explanation that I can find is that there was some, by, she was there by divine appointment of the Holy Spirit. Her faith was a gift from God, as it says in Ephesians 2.8. Had her faith been made, have been something that she had made up herself or conjured up herself, she would have given up the very moment that Jesus said, I, sent, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But her faith was not man-made, it was God-given. So for our first point, I want you to notice her approach to the Master. Now, I got a lot of sub-points to this, and I didn't have Sandy put them up there because it would have, it would have been overwhelming. So if you want to write these down, you're welcome to. The sub-point that we're going to go to, her approach to the Master, the sub-point, by faith she came seeking mercy. Now verse 22 says, she began to cry out, have mercy on me. Positionally, she had no claim on God or the Messiah. Ethically, she knew that she was an alien and an outcast, which meant uh, she was lost without hope. And so she has to beg for mercy. And this is proof of her penitence. She deserved nothing, and she knew she deserved nothing. She knew she was unworthy of Christ, but she knew her only hope for His gracious mercy. That's all she had. So she came with a repentant heart, seeking the Lord and seeking His mercy. Matthew Henry wrote this. He said, quote, God will have chosen a remnant out of all nations, even the most unlikely. Listen to that part. Even the most unlikely. Who would have been a more unlikely candidate than this Canaanite woman? How about maybe a Moabitess named Ruth? How about that person you look at in the mirror every morning? Ain't none of us worthy, are we? Yes to all the above. Yes to all the above. And when, when we came to the Master in faithful repentance, we came with the knowledge of just how unworthy we really were. MacArthur wrote, he said, Faith that apprehends the blessings of Christ involves repentance that comes from a deep, sincere sense of unworthiness. But as unlikely or unworthy as we were, praise God, He loved us enough to make us worthy to be included into His flock. Here's what Jesus told the Jews in John chapter 10, verse 16. He says, I have other sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Thank God for that. Look at verse 22 again. She said, Have mercy on me, Lord, Son of David. Now, if you're writing this down, by faith she called on the Lord. By faith she called on the Lord. Notice what she's doing here. By calling on the Lord Jesus in her hour of greatest need, she is turning her back on the gods of her people and is openly placing her faith in the Lord, the Son of David. And this is significant because by addressing Him as Lord, she is expressing her sense of His deity and dominion and power. And by calling Him the Son of David, she was expressing her faith that he was and is Messiah. Now, what is faith? Your faith is only as good as the object that you've placed it in. You understand what I'm saying? Let me give you an example of what I mean. Skydiving is purely an act of faith. <laughs> Say it ain't so. Come on. Because you're putting your faith and trust that that guy that packed that chute done it right. So that when you pull that cord, it's going to deploy. And your, li and your life will be spared all the way to earth. Right? That's exactly right. So it was for this Canaanite woman. She put her trust in the only one who could give her the necessary faith to believe and to answer her request. Her hope was in Christ alone. Now being a Gentile and an idol worshiper, how would she have known to address Jesus by that name except it had been revealed to her by the Father? There's a good example in Scripture of that. That's what Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16. He says that flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So how he revealed it to her, I don't know. Maybe it's possible that the Lord allowed her to hear his name, hear the name of Jesus reference to Son of David. Did she fully understand the significance of that title? Not likely. But whether she fully understood it or not, she understood enough to know that he was what she was looking for. And so she went to him. And that's more than can be said for the Pharisees who had plenty of understanding and knew exactly what people meant when they called Jesus the son of David. But unlike this woman who cried out in faith, the Pharisees were so blinded by their own pride, uh, they couldn't see what she could see. That here was the Messiah. Here's the Messiah. The one they have been waiting on for all their lives. And instead of coming to Him, 
and, and falling down at his feet and begging for forgiveness and begging for mercy like this Canaanite woman did that hated him and they plotted to kill him. But look, at, look again at verse 22. She says, Lord, son of David, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. By faith, she cries out for her daughter to be healed. By faith, she cries out for her daughter to be healed. Although she didn't understand the full meaning of Christ's lordship, she knew about his healing power. She loved her daughter more than her own life. And so she turned her back on everything that she knew. And what did she know? All she knew was what she grew up in. So in our in our regards, in today's regards, the same thing. You know what you know with what you grew up in. She turned her back on the worship of the goddess Ashtar. She found out firsthand, she found out firsthand that a stone was incapable of healing her daughter. It couldn't grant her request. And from her family's perspective, by turning to Christ, she turned her back on them and her culture, choosing to plead for the mercy of the one, or from the one, true source that could deliver her daughter. And with that appeal, she publicly affirmed the Lord's power over her former gods. When you and I cried out, Lord, Son of David, rescue my wretched life, we, did we have a full understanding of, of the one whom we cried out to? No. But we knew enough to know that he was the only one who could heal our brokenness. And we turned our backs on the false hope of this life. And from a world's perspective, we turned our backs on our family and our friends when we chose to withdraw fellowship from the former things and to turn to the true blessed hope that can only be found in Christ. Our conscious choice to follow Christ is a public affirmation of His transforming power that has taken place in our lives. For our second point, I want you to notice her anguish before the Master. Her anguish before the Master. Write this down. Jesus responds with silence. Look at verse 23. But he did not answer her a word. Now how about that? How about that? He didn't answer her a word. Why would Jesus respond this way? I'm going to back up just one second. In verse 22, she called him Jesus, son of David. Which would be correct. That's, that's the correct response. But one commentator said, because she's a Gentile, she had no right to address him as such, and that's why he didn't answer her. I say he didn't answer her because this is a test of her faith. This is a test of the woman's faith. Theologian and author Herbert Lockyer points out something that I had never given thought before. Here's what he said. He said, artists never depict Christ with his back turned. He stood with his face, he stood his face to blind Barnabas, to the foaming demoniac, to the limping paralytic, through the turbulent sea which he hushed, to the dead whom he raised. But here he turned his back on the suffering woman, throwing positive discouragement upon her. Now, has this ever occurred to anyone? Jesus was not obligated to give this Canaanite woman an audience, let alone answer her request. He was not obligated to. I want you to consider Job for a second. God owed Job no explanation for what was taking place in his life. And as far as we know, he never got an explanation. He may now that he's in heaven and standing before God, but he didn't get an explanation while it was taking place, even though he earnestly sought for one. But just like Job pleaded for an answer, this woman is pleading for help. You know, some people have this misconception that when we ask for something, we're supposed to get it. Because here's what we've heard growing up all our lives. Whatever we ask in the name of Jesus, we'll receive. Jesus said this in John 14, verses 13 through 14. He says, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And Jesus was not lying there. He's telling the truth. He, and when he made that statement, that was a true statement. And mature believers understand that this is not some kind of a magic formula that obligates God to answer our selfish request. Quest. But for immature believers, here are three things that must be put in place. First, number one, our request must be consistent with God's will and purposes for the kingdom. Remember the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, our prayers just can't be, God, I need a Cadillac to my car broke down. No, that's not how it works. What is His will for your life? What It, it might be a will He wants you to have a Yugo and not a Cadillac. And instead of walking, you'll gladly take that you go. 
Number two, we must acknowledge our spiritual poverty, our unworthiness, and our total dependence on Christ alone. What does the song say? Unto the, God, the cross, I, I come to the cross, I have nothing in my hands. All I bring is me. I, I know that's not the right words, but you understand what I'm talking about. We are unworthy. We're totally dependent on Christ. And number three, we must express our sincere desire that God be glorified. Is our request bringing Him glory? If He answers that request, will it glorify Him? Or is it just going to beef us up? Now back to what Jesus said in the Canaanite woman. Sorry to call her Canadian woman. It's a Canaanite woman. <laughs> now, she never heard Jesus say these words. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. She never heard those words. Pretty confident she didn't hear those words. She came to Jesus, though, displaying all three of these characteristics that I just gave you. But I think there's something that gets overlooked here. What was the Lord's mission? What was the Lord's mission when He came to earth? What did God send me to do? And the quick answer is to seek and to save that which is lost, right? Yeah, that's right. And which we're so thankful for that. Luke 19, 10. But there it was an order in which all these things had to take place. Jesus said, and I'm going to read this verse again, John 6, 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. What was the will of God concerning Jesus' mission? Look at verse 24. Look at verse 24 in our text. Write this down. Jesus responds with indifference. He responds with indifference. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now let me emphasize two things right here. One, Jesus was subordinate to the divine will of the Father first and foremost. Why? Because he came to do what Adam was supposed to do and didn't do. He obeyed the law. He obeyed God. He obeyed everything perfectly. And number two, the focus of his ministry was on the Jewish people because in God's plan, it was to be the Jewish people who were to make him known among the nations. Romans 1.16, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Alexander McLaren wrote this. He said, the fire is to be gathered in the hearth if it is to afterward to warm the chamber. You got to build the fire before it ever warms the house. Who made God known? The Jewish people. They were the patriarchs. They were the judges. They were the priests. They were the prophets. They were the apostles. The, the only Gentile that had anything to do with the Word of God was Luke. Okay? He's the only one to write. Everybody else was Jewish. God made Himself known to Abraham, and the rest is His story at that point. He is God. He, is, he blesses whom He chooses, and that does not set well in the minds of a lot of people. And neither does this. He owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. Now look at verse 26. Now we see this. Write this down. Jesus responds with reproach. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now the Jews consider the Gentiles to be dogs. Now there are two different Greek words here for in the New Testament for the word dog. One often refers to the mongrels that ran in a pack out there in the street. Okay, that's what they refer to. The other is referred to as a family pet. Jesus called this woman a dog, but he referred to her as the family pet. That still ain't much of a compliment, but it's, it's as if Jesus is saying that the Jews were masters over the Gentiles. The, the word children in that sentence is referring to the Jewish people. And she would have known that. She would have known that. And I'm sure she would have had this thought in her many times. So it really doesn't faze her too much. Most of all, or most people, when something like that, somebody throws out what they would consider an indignation or an insult, they would lash out with their own indignation, saying, you call yourself a loving God. Well, not this woman. Instead, she makes her appeal to the Master. I want you to look at the first part of verse 25. And write this down. She came to Him humbly. She came to Him humbly. Here's the verse. But she came and began to bow down before Him. Now, to bow down is from the Greek word proskuneo, which literally means to prostrate oneself. It's also translated to worship. Now, I can't say with certainty that she was bowing down on the basis of actual worship, but it was definitely an act of humility. She literally threw herself at the feet of Jesus. 
Instead of hurling insults and accusations of unkindness because of his seeming indifference, she humbly prostrated herself. Write this down. She came to him in earnest or earnestly in submission to his authority and she cried out, Lord, help me. Now you can hear this in her voice. This poor woman was in agony. Which one, of us, which one of you mothers, or fathers for that matter, wouldn't earnestly submit yourself to someone in authority for the life of your child? You would, wouldn't you? David did that in 2 Samuel 12. He prayed for his baby boy. He laid face down for seven days praying for that baby boy to be healed, and that baby boy didn't live. It was the will of God that that child not live. That might be hard for some people to understand. But you have to understand the whole context behind that story. 1 Samuel 10, Hannah wept bitterly and she prayed in earnest for a child. Luke 22, 44, it says, Jesus being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. This Canaanite woman had the determination of Jacob who, when he was wrestling with the Lord, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Notice how she responded. She didn't use the term son of David this time. William McDonald wrote this. He said, if she couldn't come to him as a Jew to her Messiah, she would come to him as a creature to her creator. The term son of David was, was a term that was used only by the Jews. And this could only be understood by the Jews in regards that they knew the Messiah would be called such. He would, he would be called the son of David. Here, I want you to listen to her use of the term could have been regarded as an insincere, uh, insincere comment. And this time she used the words Lord, which is curios, which means supreme in authority or one who owns slaves. She was submitting to his lordship over her. All right, she came to Jesus humbly. She came to Jesus earnestly. And now watch this. Write this down. She came to him subtly. Subtly. Jesus said to her in verse 26, It is not good to take the children's bread, the Jewish blessing, and throw it to the dogs, the Gentiles. Now verse 27. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even, dog, even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Now do you all see what she's saying here? This is incredible insight. Yes, Lord, I can't deny that I'm a dog. I can't deny that I'm sinful. I can't deny that I'm unworthy. I humbly confess that I deserve zero. I don't deserve anything. And I have absolutely no right to ask for children's bread. She's absent of pride. She's absent of self, she's, uh, absence of self-reliance. There's no self-righteousness found in her words. She was more than willing to settle for the crumbs that fell from the master's table as it would to the little puppies. Alfred Edersheim words it this way. He says, if they are house dogs, then they are the masters. And under his table, and, uh, and when he breaks the bread to give to the children, the crumbs fall all around. And as St. Matthew puts it, the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. Heathenism may be like the dogs when compared with the children's place and privileges, but he is their master still and under his table. And when he breaks the bread, there is enough for them to spare. Lord, if I'm a dog, I'm your dog. I'm yours. Now, one can only speculate, but I like to think in my mind that Jesus had a smile on his face when this took place. Not that she bested him. Not that she got the best of him, no. She passed the test. She passed the test. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3, He says, Unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of God. She repented of her idol worship and she submitted herself as a humble child to the Lordship of Christ. Edersheim says she's no longer under the table. Rather, she is sitting at the table as a partner of the children's bread. He wrote this. He said, he was no longer her Jewish Messiah, but truly the son of David. Now she understood what, or now she understood what she prayed. She was a daughter of Abraham, and what had taught her all of this was faith in his person and work as not only just enough for the Jews, but enough to spare for all, children at the table and the dogs under it. Amen. That's exactly right. Amen. Paul said it best in Galatians 3. Here lately I've been using this passage a lot, but it's been applying. He says, for, all, for you are all sons of God 
through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Amen. Well, for this poor Canaanite woman... We've witnessed her approach to the Master, her anguish before the Master, her appeal to the Master. Finally, let's look at the last one, her attainment from the Master. Look at the first part of verse 28. And you write this down. Jesus commends her faith. Jesus commends her faith. Then Jesus said to her, O oh woman, your faith is great. Do you do y'all realize that there are only two people that Christ commended them for having great faith? The Canaanite woman was one, and the other was a centurion. Both of these are Gentiles. Both of these are Gentiles. And they had no Jewish understanding of the importance of the Messiah. But they trusted Him. They loved Him as a friend. Even if He seemed to be indifferent to their need, as He did with His Canaanite woman. They still trusted Him. Now look at the next part of verse 28. Jesus grants her request. Jesus grants her request. Jesus said, It shall be done for you as you wish. Matthew Henry said, Great believers may have what they will for asking. When our will conforms to the will of Christ's precepts, His will concurs with the will of our desire. Those that will deny Christ, nothing shall, or excuse me, those that will deny Christ, nothing shall find that they, he, he will deny them nothing at the last. Though for a time He seems to hide His face from them. At the beginning of this passage, it seemed as if Jesus was ignoring this woman because he wouldn't even look at her. Christian, if it seems like God is not hearing your prayers, listen to me. Rest assured, he hears your prayers. He hears them. He may not respond as quickly as you want him to or in the manner that you want him to, but never lose trust in his sovereign power and timing. He knows what he's doing. Look at the last part of verse 28. Jesus heals her daughter. And her daughter was healed at once, it says. This mother's faith prevailed. Charles Spurgeon made this observation. He said, the Lord of glory surrendered to the faith of the woman. <laughs> Pretty good statement. Like Abraham, she grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Romans 4.20. Like Jacob, she wrestled with the Lord and would not let go until he blessed her. That's Genesis 32.26. She lived the words of Jeremiah 29.13, which says this. You will seek me and find me when you search me, search for me with all your heart. And she searched for him with all her heart. She did just that. Her faith prevailed because she delighted herself in the Lord. She fully surrendered to his lordship and he gave her the desire of her heart. And that was to see her young daughter healed and delivered from that demon possession. What are the desires of your heart today? Are they to seek the kingdom of God first? Are they to bring glory to God at all costs? To have that mindset, you must first fully surrender to his lordship. Now, the Canaanite woman came seeking for help for her daughter, only her daughter, who was demon-possessed and was willing to humble herself and to the lowest level to attain it. Friend, you have only one soul. That's all you got. And if you've never surrendered that to the lordship of Christ, then it's still in Satan's possession. So I beseech you, seek the Lord while he may be found. We're not promised tomorrow. You only got one soul. You only got one life here. One chance to do it. And I say that for the benefit of folks here and for the benefit of those watching to see this video. Don't let that opportunity pass you by. Will you humble yourself before the Master at all costs? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God, thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for this time that we can come together to study your word. Now, Lord, see what you've done in this, this woman's life. Lord, you're doing it in lives every day. Lord, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for, for putting your, pouring your mercy out on me and your grace out on me. Lord, I thank you, Father, for all that. Lord, I pray that you speak to every heart. Lord, that your will be done in the lives here today. And the Lord, that those that may not know you as Lord, that they would, they would humble themselves before you, just as this woman did, and cry out to you. Lord, just give me the crumbs off your table. I'll be satisfied with that as long as I'm part of you. Lord, just give me what you have. But Lord, we know more than that. We know that you fill us with your grace. You lavish your grace upon us. Lord, help those that don't know it to come see it for themselves. And we ask these things in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen.